we'll just start you off with an O'Donohue quote to set the tone for the Louise Lasser debacle. She was a nice woman going through a few problems, said Michael, but I wanted to force her to eat her goddamn pigtails at gunpoint. He walked off the show that week in protest, as a matter of fact, describing her condition as clinically berserk. I'm fairly certain that's not a legitimate psychiatric prognosis, especially coming from Mr. Mike, but I can see his point. According to Hill and Weingrad, 20 minutes before air, Lasser locked herself in her dressing room and refused to go on. The cast, as they do the next week for a very inebriated Chris Christopherson, divvied up Lasser's parts and prepared to go on without her, which I have to admit I greatly wish had happened instead of what we got. An hour of pure, unadulterated indulgence of a coked-out soap star's wounded ego. Well, that's nice. <laughs> begins one of the worst hosting catastrophes in the history of Saturday Night Live. Louise Lasser was the star of a surprise hit show called Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, a Norman Lear-helmed parody soap opera which had aired nearly every weeknight since early 1976. The show was simultaneously a satire and devoted practitioner of the outrageous tropes common to serialized entertainment such as soaps and telenovelas, and the titular character Mary Hartman had frequent emotional breakdowns due to the great stress of the weekly tragedies befalling her. It turns out that Lasser's personal state of mind was not far removed from her characters. Having been arrested for cocaine possession in LA the week prior, she was on a bit of a precipice emotionally and was nearing a breaking point. With hindsight, the fact she starts off her monologue flailing her arms anxiously and talking agitatedly about her character having a nervous breakdown is a little painful and on the nose in how close it is to what we, the audience, were witnessing right in front of us. If there was a script, it would seem she didn't stick to it for very long. I suspect she was just being extemporaneous and improvising dialogue, which is not something usually encouraged on SNL. It's uncomfortable to watch, honestly. She does that typical coked out rubbing your teeth thing, won't stop swinging her arms around, and confesses that she hopes the show will be great, but it probably won't because she's so nervous working live. She says Lauren told her, you know, He said, uh, you're naturally funny. He said, uh, just, you know, you go out there and you be yourself and you, quote, wing it. <laughs> Some wing it. <laughs> what? Somebody talking to her from off stage motions for her to wrap it up. <laughs> and she freaking responds directly to him like she's confused at the very clear direction he's giving her to, you know, go ahead and end this awkward mess and move the monologue along. She just looks right at the guy and says, What? Like it's her first time on stage or something. It's really a sight to behold. She then launches into a personal story, which she thinks is hilarious. It starts with, I'm in Beverly Hills, right? And the audience thinks it's cute and that she's going to send up her recent arrest and legal travails. Nope, it's not what you think it's going to be. She then rambles her way into a meandering story about having lunch with Jack Nicholson. She corrects the freaking cue cards at one point about a minor semantic quibble, then mumbles that she's tired and trails off. She freezes, then melts down before our very eyes in what appears to be an actual honest-to-god panic attack on live TV. The audience doesn't know what to think, and I don't either, 40-something years later. The next minute or so is tough to stomach. I've hosted open mic nights before where I've had to come to the rescue of somebody who was just bombing and starting to panic, and I know that look of terror when the performer senses that the polite contract they have with the audience is broken. They failed at being an entertainer, the veil is lifted, and they're naked to the ridicule of it all. It's very unnerving. It makes my teeth hurt, it's so awkward, and my natural impulse is to try to put her out of her misery and just get her off stage. Anyway, the audience tries to be game and support her to go along with the bit, but it soon becomes clear that there's no bit. She's just freaking out on live TV, and there's nothing she can do to stop it. It's like the beginning of a bad acid trip that you know won't be ending anytime soon. The show is an hour and a half long, and you can't do anything about it. You might as well settle in, because you're in it for the long haul. After going nearly catatonic for an excruciating three or four seconds, she flees the stage. The fact that there are cameras set up to follow her lets you know that this was at least somewhat scripted, but I sense real panic as she rushes into her dressing room and locks the door. Knowing in hindsight that she'd nearly refused to go on only minutes earlier, it's doubly funny to me that this is what they decided on as the premise for her monologue, given the fact that they had a whole week to come up with something. Obviously, the writers knew what they were working with. Gilda attempts to console her through the door to no avail, so then Danny comes and knocks on her door acting like he's a probation officer from the LAPD. Considering the state Lasser was in, it probably rattled her at least a little bit, even though this part was obviously scripted. 
They work the land shark into the whole mess at the end. Chevy reaches his dang arm out of the mouth to knock, which is adorable. He's able to coax her out by promising her the cover of Time magazine. Now that's a nice dig at publicity obsessed starlets, but it genuinely doesn't seem to me to have been the case with Lasser. It's the only time she seems like she's acting in this whole bit. I don't think she was gunning for publicity at all. The panic and discomfort here seem as genuine as can be. I honestly believe after watching that monologue that Lasser was in a bad place emotionally and the writers, having picked up on it, wrote a piece that played it up for laughs. Simple as that. I'm not sure why Lasser agreed to do it. She couldn't have felt very comfortable with the material because we know from multiple accounts that she genuinely freaked the fuck out and practically had to be threatened and pushed on stage. She'd refused plenty of material, so I don't know why she went along with this premise. I do know that some, including Lasser to an extent, say the whole thing was manufactured and played up for a thrill of live TV type sensationalism. And to some extent, maybe it was slightly manufactured in the sense that the writers chose to lean into and exploit Lasser's insecurity rather than coddle and support her. However, at least according to Chevy, that doesn't seem to have been a possibility. He says she was self-absorbed to the point of solipsism, but that sounds like the pot calling the kettle a coke addict to me. Still, if she wasn't willing to work with the writers, as she apparently was not, refusing to do sketches with anyone other than Chevy and a dog, I can see that they had little choice but to use Lasser's own quirks as the basis for the week's material. I don't think working with what they were given explains away or counts as manufacturing such a legendarily bad hosting performance as this, then. In my opinion, the responsibility for the show's failure rests solely with Lasser, and regardless of how she seems to want to portray the whole affair in later interviews, this episode isn't bad on purpose as some sort of meta Mary Hartman-esque kind of statement on celebrity. It's just simply, unironically, bad television. While researching this episode, I saw conjecture from a few critics that the choice of host and musical guests this week were intended to somehow capture the attention of filmmaker Woody Allen, who was a huge deal among the hip New York comedy scene and apparently coveted as a potential host by Lauren. Louise Lasser had been married to Allen and appeared in several of his films, and music guests the Preservation Hall Jazz Band had been featured in Allen's 1973 film Sleeper. This theory seems like perhaps a bit of a stretch, but I can't disprove it either. It makes as much sense as any other reason for these fellows to be here, although as a former resident of New Orleans, it warms my soul to see this long-deceased iteration of the beloved institution. Here, they play one of their signature numbers, Panama Rag, and it's delightful in every way, the only moment of pure joy in an otherwise pretty lifeless outing. I can only wonder what these older gentlemen must have thought of the evening of comedy to which they'd been treated thus far. I'll bet there was a fair amount of shrugging and head-scratching. Pardo forgot to do one of the taglines at the beginning, and Chase gamely waited and allowed him to slip it in. It's uncharacteristically unselfish of Chevy. I'm Chevy Chase, and boy are you glad to see me. Completely falls flat. No laugh whatsoever. They are not apparently happy to see him. In this week's headlines, Gerald Ford is old and stupid. Walter Mondale thinks Gerald Ford is old and stupid. George Wallace is a racist, and Jimmy Carter loves oranges and sucking blood from Florida voters. Belushi interviews Gilda as Olga, a Russian gymnast whose popularity was usurped at the Winter Olympics by Nadia Comaneci. I would like to take that balance beam and stick it in her eye. <laughs> in halting Russian inflected English is a fun punchline, I'll admit. More Muhammad Ali antics. This time, he held a press conference to comb his hair, ostensibly because that's the photo the writing team had available of him at the time they wrote the gag. The Viking spacecraft lands on Mars, and Chevy reports from the scene over footage of action figures. We have an update live report from the Democratic National Convention, which is apparently already over by the time they get somebody there to cover it. Except that's not actually the case. They did actually send Lasser and Chase to film a piece at the convention, but it was deemed unusable for some reason. Hmm, I wonder what Chase and Lasser might have gotten up to at the convention that led to all that unusable footage. Good God, this is awful. The normally content-neutral and non-judgmental online resource the SNL Wiki offers in the film of her own design, Louise Lasser rambles incoherently in a diner. <laughs> they can't even pretend to be objective about it. Here we have seven minutes of what I would more succinctly term pretentious amateur coke shit. 
I think it's meant to be an unpleasant night after a speedbender discussion Lasser is having with some guy at a diner. But she mumbles through her improvised dialogue with an utter lack of grace, fidgets uncontrollably with her hair, and both actors flub lines and visibly ask for cues and direction throughout. It's as if they did the entire thing in one take, but then made no cuts or edits, even when they were off script, discussing technical aspects of the shoot, or otherwise not in character. I mean, is this meant to be fourth wall breaking auteur filmmaking or something? It's literally just her having breakdown after breakdown and failing to film a damn diner scene. It's not funny. It's sad and bewildering and just unbelievably awkward to watch. I feel genuine discomfort and am glad when it ends. I'm not kidding. This was pre-taped. They didn't have to air it, but chose to. Why did they do that? Seriously, it makes her look like a crazy person, and I almost get the feeling that they chose to air it along with the closing, a film by Louise Lasser, tagline, just to drive home the fact that this was what they were reduced to working with for the week. Just so you knew who to blame. Whew, I mean, just exhausting in its badness, almost impressively so. Uh, Chevy, uh, I don't think it's that uh, John was hurt, I just think he, he feels you're getting more attention All than right. he is. You know what I mean, he did? Uh, the cold open is a fourth wall break in which the cast, as themselves, discuss Belushi returning from L.A. and making up with Chevy. This seems like a riff on press coverage of the time, which had already picked up on their rivalry and Belushi's early dissatisfaction with Chase's larger role. Belushi had in fact only about a week earlier been published in a Rolling Stone interview in which he said, Chevy holding the show as star, I don't think it'd work. It sure wouldn't be the same show. I know I want in no way to become Carl Reiner to his Sid Caesar. Once we've been to a f***ing star system here, everything changes. Considering Chase was soon to leave the program, leaving Belushi to assume the mantle of breakout star, this is all pretty on the nose, and I genuinely enjoy the way they bring the performers' personalities and personal lives into the context of the material of the show. Anyway, to close the sketch, the two make up and do an elaborate handshake, which devolves into buddy punches and then John decking Chevy, at which point he delivers the tagline. <laughs> Live from New York, it's Saturday Night! <laughs> Garrett, as dictator Edie Amin, starts off the next skit with... You know, it's too bad that venereal disease doesn't just strike Jews. <laughs> I didn't have a clue where this was going, but I can tell you it wouldn't be going anywhere near network TV in 2021. Anyway, they rhyme ED with VD, as in venereal disease, and I think that pretty much sums up how the sketch plays out from there. This seems to be a reference to a recent hostage situation in which Israeli special forces had embarrassed Amin, but it's mostly Garrett doing a broad African accent and making insensitive Jew and venereal disease jokes in the voice of a brutal dictator. Still, I'm seeing worse this season, maybe even this episode. Good grief. In the only skit Lasser agreed to do with a member of the ensemble, Lasser stares wordlessly into Chevy's eyes and awkwardly paws at his face for a parody of an Ingmar Bergman film. I put massive air quotes around parody because parodies are supposed to be entertaining, thought-provoking, or funny. This is not any of those things. I think it was mostly chosen because it didn't require Lasser to do anything, and she nearly fails at that in which Jane and Gilda again play Manson family members as almost lovable adults. It's nevertheless pretty creepy, and Lorraine plays Squeaky as a little more intense this time, if still ineffectual and silly. Look, one of us have got to break the silence, you know? I'd read about this one, but didn't expect it to really be as cringy as they said. It is, and then some. Against the objections of everyone, including Lauren, Lasser insisted on doing a sketch in which she essentially has a serious relationship conversation with a golden retriever over coffee. The dog is well behaved, thankfully, if a little confused when Lasser keeps yelling the word fetch as part of her monologue, but the premise is just her berating a dog for being a poor excuse for a husband. You can't marry a dog, Louise. What did you expect? Sorry, I'll compose myself. Jeez, the audience is polite. But this just is not funny. To the extent there is a joke, it's just the silly premise. And in practice, it's just her poorly doing an acting exercise at a confused audience at a put-upon dog. 
By the end, it's so quiet, all you can hear is the dog panting. Gee. I'm breaking my own rule here and giving out two coveted worst award things in this episode. If it's even possible to have two worst things, this would definitely be the episode to pull it off. Thank God for Dan Aykroyd. I know I say that a lot this first season, but really. I've forgotten what funny looked like over these past long... Jesus, we're only 20 minutes into the show at this point. He's a presenter here, introducing a musical number about the history of the cathode ray tube, with the girls singing along in a Motown style with suitable energy and aplomb over some truly dodgy blue screen effects. Thus was the danger of VFX on live TV in the 70s, but I'd say they pulled it off pretty well for the time. Teen Talk seems like a Maryland piece to me, in that it's just a short character piece for Jane and Gilda, and seems like the sort of thing she, or maybe Ann Beats, might have written. Originally, the sketch had been written for Lasser and Radner, but the host deemed it too salacious, so the part was given to Jane. I think she does it better than Lasser would have been able, especially considering Lasser's condition the night of taping. I think Lasser probably just didn't want to do it, because the sketch is hardly what I'd call racy. In any event, I'm glad she isn't here to ruin it. The two play teenagers discussing their nascent encounters with their boyfriends, and all the little details are just right to make the dialogue believable. It brings to mind the earlier sleepover skit from the Madeline Kahn show. These sorts of sketches don't often get mentioned in discussions of the best of, but there's a warmth and familiarity to them that really makes them work on a timeless level. A lot of the humor on SNL doesn't. We have Belushi as himself hawking the new John Belushi fashion collection. Literally just him selling the clothes he's wearing because he's broke. By the end of it, he's trying to sell his records too, including... I got some grand funk, only listened to once. Okay. <laughs> Gee, I wonder what he needs all that money for. Ackroyd debuts his quite serviceable Carter imitation here and helpfully walks us through all the various tricks and ticks he's going to use to mimic the man. He's still working out the accent, and it would definitely improve once it was clear Carter would be around for a while. I gotta say it, it's an odd choice to have Carter sporting a mustache and brown hair, guys. Not a look I associate with Jimmy. You know, if I was Louise Lasser, I don't think I would have chosen to do another monologue to close the show. That's what we got, though. It's a meandering bit about how the sudden fame from Mary Hartman has been strange to live with, and while I sympathize with Lasser, this monologue has no place on a show like SNL. I think that Chevy's allegation of solipsism is right on here. The common thread through all of her monologues, the dog sketch, and the film is her own egotistical self-examination bordering on self-absorption. Cocaine as a drug really has a way of inflating one's sense of self to the extent that conversations become inevitably one-sided affairs centered around whoever's doing the coke. And that's what this feels like, talking to a self-pitying, sad sack cokehead. As they panned out over the audience at the end of the show, I was struck with the thought, I wonder if they know they're at one of the worst episodes SNL will ever make. Obviously, nobody there knew that night that the show would outlive them all and become an institution, but it was pretty clear by that point that they'd be back for at least another year. Did the audience know this was a worse than normal night? A train wreck even? Or were they just happy to be there for this cool new phenomenal TV program? <sighs> I can't imagine how they felt, but for me, that was a goddamn journey. Honestly, I'm left unsure at the end of the night how much of what I just watched was intentionally awkward, off-putting, and uncomfortable, and how much was accidental. It's obvious that, at some point, the writers just leaned into the shit show they all saw on the horizon, but there's no way they purposefully crapped out something like this for their anticipated return to air. For her part, Lasser says she was acting, that all of the nervousness was faked to be more like her Mary Cartman character, that the dead air and apparent flubs were purposeful, and that she wasn't on drugs during the show. She also called Chase, one of her detractors, mean and a bully, and claimed that the show hasn't been rerun at her manager's request, not because it was a dumpster fire that Lauren Black listed. Now, she's still living, and I have no desire to be sued for slander, so I'm not gonna say those things aren't true. What I will say is that if she really was just acting like a bad, coked up SNL host, but not actually a bad, coked up SNL host, she deserves an Emmy because that shit was convincing. It even fooled Lauren in the cast. 
We close out our first season next week with a boozy but still better affair hosted by a mostly seated, because he's wasted, Chris Christopherson. Stay tuned. Stay tuned.